Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 169. How can you improve a classification model while avoiding overfitting? Once you have a model, what tools can you use to explain it to others? This week on the show, we talk with author and Python trainer Matt Harrison about his new book, Effective XG Boost: Tuning, Understanding, and Deploying Classification Models. Matt talks about the process of developing the book and how he wanted it to be an interactive experience for the reader. He explains the concepts of gradient boosting and provides metaphors for developing a model. He shares his appreciation for exploratory data analysis as a crucial step in understanding your data. And he shares additional libraries to help you explain your model. He also illustrates why covering the complete process is essential, from exploring data and building a model to final deployment. He shares many of the tools he found along the way. This episode is brought to you by Scout APM. Scout APM is Python monitoring for swift issue resolution, pinpoint bottlenecks in your code, and optimize performance. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Matt, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Excited to be here. I appreciate you inviting me back on. Well, we ran into each other at PyCon, and you handed me a book and I was like, okay, cool. Um, the book is Effective XG Boost and I enjoy diving deeper into lots of these topics. And I know some of the basics and the book kind of helped me dig into it. When when did you start thinking about doing this book? Yeah, the book came out of, so for my day job, I do a lot of corporate training. And in the past couple of years, I've been doing a lot of machine learning or teaching machine learning to to my clients. And the book came out of scratching my own itch, finding that the content that's out there is not uh, what I would like or what I would like to learn from. And so I read what was out there around XG Boost and was like, okay, I think I think I can provide something that's more actionable and provides content that other, is not found in other places. So that, that was the impetus there. Yeah, yeah. And so when did you start writing it? Um, that's a great question. I'd say the book probably took a year plus to write. So, okay. Yeah. I was trying to think of like, what's the age of XG Boost? Yeah, XG Boost has been around for a while. I don't know the exact data off the top of my head, but probably early 2010 decade. So, okay. So it's been around for a while. History of it is that it, it, it sort of came onto the scene through Kaggle, which is a machine learning competition. Yeah. They basically ran like crowdsourced machine learning competitions where you would do some prediction and companies would basically sponsor these competitions. So they're like, here's our data. We just want to make a model. And, and rather than having someone internal make it, we'll just outsource it to the crowds and pay pay a, a, a fee for whoever makes the best model. And uh, when this XG Boost model came out, it kind of took the, I would say, the tabular data world by storm and that this model was very popular and started winning a bunch of competitions there. And, and since then, it's it's been, I would say, the de facto uh, tool for, for doing tabular prediction. Okay. So there's probably a lot of terms there that some of your audience might not know. So I'm happy to yeah. happy to dig into some of those if, if you want. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we should start with tabular prediction. Like what Okay. What would that mean in the you know, to like the, the average data scientist? Yeah. So prediction is where we have data and we basically have labels for data and we want to train a model that's able to given some piece of data 
predict a label. There's roughly two classes of prediction. It's called by academics supervised learning. So the idea with supervised is that you give it a label so it knows what those labels are and, and, and can make the model knowing that. Okay. And, and so tabular refers to the fact that basically you have rows and columns uh, versus uh, more unstructured data. So you can think of this as if you've got data in a database where you've got rows representing maybe um, patients and maybe you want to predict whether they have cancer or not. Maybe you have a bunch of columns that might have indications about their health. And, and some of those indicator or some of those columns might have information that, that can be useful in predicting whether they have cancer or not. So that, that would be tabular prediction in contrast with uh, what a lot of people use prediction in, in unstructured ways, which might be using something like video data or audio data or image data, which isn't necessarily rows and columns per se, or it's not necessarily a predefined uh, size or shape, if that makes sense. Yeah, so it's instead of it being rather structured with kind of regular rows that somebody might think of like a Excel spreadsheet or, or a, yep. you know, a database kind of thing where not necessarily every row is going to have every column in it, but it at least is structured enough that you can kind of look at relationships between things and kind of figure them out. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the world, I, I like to say a lot of the world runs on Excel. So so if you have data <laughs> yeah. sitting in Excel or you have data in a database, th those would be probably good candidates for, for using a tool like XGBoost. Okay, cool. I guess this is kind of related to that in a way, like you're saying the type of data that the person would have that would be looking for building a model upon it. I kind of always like to ask the authors, like, you know, who's the book for? But it's kind of like a related thing. It's like, well, if you have this kind of data, but also what other kind of qualities would uh, a person who might be interested in this book have? Sure. Yeah. So, so who could leverage this? Again, at, at a high level, if you've got data sitting in a database or in Excel and you're trying to make predictions about that, right? So you're trying to predict whether someone has cancer, whether someone's going to default on a loan. Maybe you want to predict whether a mushroom is poisonous or you want to predict like a species. Th those are typically what we call classification problems where we're trying to give a label to a row of data or predict a label. And, and the book focuses on classification. XGBoost also can do other things. Uh, a common use for XGBoost is regression, which is also supervised learning. But instead of predicting a label, regression is predicting a numeric value where you might say, I want to predict how much a house costs, right? Maybe you're making a housing model or you want to predict like what someone's heart rate would be after subjecting them to, to certain things. Predicting a numeric value would, would be called regression. So if you've got data sitting around in, in tabular format and you want to uh, give some label to it, common uses might be for like marketing purposes or customer retention. You want to look at whether a customer return or not. So if, if you have information about customers that have churn and you have certain columns that you could feed into this model and say, and the model can actually tell you, you can say, okay, these are the columns that are important that will, will basically predict whether someone churns or not or have predictive value in them. And, and then what you can do is you could make a model with your customer data and it could say, okay, these customers are candidates or look like they will churn based on past performance. And maybe you want to take some action at that point in order to prevent the churn. Maybe you give them a discount or you right. give them some service that, that helps them overcome their issues with your product. Uh, that's, that'd be a pretty common use case. Another common use case is in finance, you know, whether to give someone a loan or not. Right. Pretty, uh, straightforward to, to take information about folks who have gotten a loan in the past and who have, who's defaulted, who hasn't defaulted, and then use that to construct a model to decide those sorts of decisions. Yeah. So if somebody was wanting to dive into the book, it doesn't spend as much time on, you know, you have a previous books you have on pandas and other getting people up and running. 
do you feel like they need to have that kind of background before they would dig into this book? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. So, so the book is is focused on using the XGBoost library from a Python point of view. So I will say that XGBoost uh, has wrappers for other languages as well, so you don't have to strictly use it from Python. So the, the content talking about XGBoost, training your model, would be applicable to other languages. Uh, you just have to change the code, so to speak. But what are the prerequisites for coming to the book for using it? Certainly background in Python is going to be useful. Uh, hopefully some experience using something to edit code, I would recommend for, for someone who is looking to make models using a tool like Jupyter. You don't have to use Jupyter. You know, you can use other tools that understand notebooks, but that interactivity is a, a little bit nicer than, say, uh, using something like Emacs to make models and then run them from the command line. Using a tool like Jupyter is nice. Pandas is probably a useful tool to to have as well and again the book doesn't really discuss pandas so to speak but oftentimes my experience is that most of the data in the world's kind of messy uh for better for worse yeah data scientists like to think that they live in this fantasy land where they're making these models and that's kind of what they do all the time but most of the time data scientists are actually taking data and, and cleaning it up or diving into the data and understanding the data and a lot of that is actually done on the panda side typically for in the python world uh, some people do that with sql or or other tools, but the book really doesn't go into the, the pre-processing of the data, so to speak, uh, for XGBoost. So that that would be something else to consider yeah. if you're if you're looking to leverage this tool. Yeah, you start with a particular data set, and the second chapter you kind of take people through some of the fundamentals of cleaning it, but not like it's not a, a book on cleaning. It's just like, hey, this is what. I did to the set and what you need to consider in this particular set. And then you actually spend a little bit more time on the exploratory data analysis part. And I, I thought that was really interesting. Why do you think that's one of the most important steps? Yeah. So th this is kind of the, the silly thing. What has a lot of the, I would say, the the sexiness appeal these days is deep learning. And the idea with deep learning is that you can just throw your data at deep learning and it will sort of unravel it and make a model for you. And while that is kind of true, like deep learning can do some cool things, if you have better data, oftentimes you can make a simpler model. And oftentimes, like people will use even simpler models than XGBoost. And so XGBoost can, from that point of view, like be a tool to do advanced exploration of your data and give you insights into your data and how your data is leading to predictions to maybe make new features to add to your model. And then with these new features, you could use a simpler model that would perform better than a smarter model with dumber data, so to speak. So for, for example, like a traditional model would be like logistic regression for classification or linear regression for doing regression models. Problem with logistic regression, so to speak, or linear regression for that matter, is that if you have nonlinear responses with your, your variables, it can't really tease that apart. For a while, I worked predicting failure modes of, of hardware. And for example, like NAND flash has a failure mode where after being produced, some percentage of that will basically fell at infancy or it, the etchings just like i don't understand the physics of it but they, they just don't work after a, a certain amount of usage like a sort of a burn-in phase they just can't survive that yeah they're exactly they okay they call it burn-in so so generally the manufacturer will burn in the device and if it passes burn-in then basically the numbers tell us that it will last until end of life. So you have sort of this bathtub curve response and okay. logistic regression or linear regression. Just if you just have age and you're trying to make a prediction based on age and you have some U shaped curve like that, <laughs> it can't really predict that because it wants something going up or down. And so if you were able to divine that there was this nonlinear relationship using something like XGBoost and some of the tools around that, then you could go back 
if you wanted a simpler model, and there are reasons why you may or may not want a simpler model, you could actually do what we call feature engineering, which is add new features to the data such that logistic regression or linear regression would be able to, you might have one that it is the age in the below the teenage years, right? Or you could have one is the age greater than the old age, right? And, and that would basically add the feature, add the information into the feature such that linear or logistic regression could, could respond to that data and do a decent job of, of fixing that. So playing around with your data, understanding it is certainly useful. Typically, when I'm going in and doing a, a training, I'm teaching subject matter experts how to apply this tool to their data. So they're coming into the class as subject matter experts. They understand their data and they want to do some modeling around it. This lets them do that relatively easily uh, to add the model and then Unlike a lot of software things where software tends to be, I mean, I could call it, say it's waterfall, but a lot of people would take exception to that issue. But software is sort of like, we need to add a button that when you click it, it sends someone a payment, right? And you can kind of say, when, when that works, this is done, we can check that off. And a lot of things in data science are more like, is this model good? That sort of question, right? It's hard to check that off. The answer is typically for a lot of those things, it depends. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. It depends on what the business case is. It depends on maybe some other parameters. It depends on maybe, uh, do you want a model that's explainable or not that someone can understand and, and, and tell the customer why they made the prediction. These are things that aren't quite as easy as like engineering, where you can just say, yeah, we can send someone some amount of money by clicking that button. And so what we see is a lot of this data modeling tends to be, okay, let's say we want to make a model. So we go out and make a model. And it, actually making a model is not that hard. It's like three lines of code in Python. But then there's this whole evaluation step, understanding how the model performed, looking at what features fed into the model, and then evaluating from a business standpoint. And then maybe at that point, it's like, okay, this model is not good enough as is, but maybe if we tweak it a little bit, it could perform better. And so let's try it again, tweaking it. And sort of rinse and repeat that process and, and see if we can get a model that will work for us. Is that in some ways why a, a tool like Jupyter is such a better, well, a more suited tool, the ability to rerun code after sort of modifying parameters and not necessarily running all of the code the way like a, a standard script editor or, you know, type of tool would work? Yeah, Jupyter lends itself really nice, this exploratory style of, of diving into your data, checking things out, right? I can make plots and have them in line. If I'm using uh, advanced libraries like Plotly, I can interact with those plots, which are kind of nice. And then, you know, depending on how you're writing your code, it's relatively easy to, oh, I forgot to do one thing. Well, if you're using Pandas, maybe you you tweak the code a little bit and then you rerun it and you don't have to sort of, context switch, so to speak, like, okay, now I'm going to go to the terminal and run in the terminal. And then I'm going to open this image over here to look at the visualization. It's just all in one place. Yeah. Having said that, I, I find that a lot of people who are use Jupyter use a lot of bad practices. So, you know, oftentimes, like I find that my clients aren't programmers, so to speak. And, and a lot of times they'll say, I don't, I don't want to be a programmer, right? I, I just want to use a tool to get my job done. So as much as I love Jupyter, there are some things that like global variables, the fact that you can run cells in any order. Yep, that's a big one. That, that makes it really nice for exploring, yeah. but uh, often for collaboration and sharing makes it a little bit more difficult. Yeah, I remember a really good talk about do you know the state, <laughs> you know, and just like you, you aren't sure unless it's been run in the order that you think it is. And yeah. And then a couple other stories we were talking about on the show where they were trying to do an analysis of Jupyter notebooks that were just, you know, out on the web that they could look at. And they were like, well, can we run them from top to bottom? And it's like, in most cases, no, you weren't able to do that because it that wasn't always the purpose of it. You know, the notebook was there, literally like many people's own notebooks where it's an incomplete statement. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. I, I like to say that there, there, 
from my point of view, there are kind of two ways of using Jupiter, right? And, and so I want to make sure I'm in the certain mindset. So one is more of the messy, this is personal for me, I'm just trying things out, messing around. But then the other one is more of a collaboration, more production type. And when I'm doing that, oftentimes I'll refactor my code, pull it out of global variables, put it into functions, but also make sure that I can execute, like you said, yeah. from the top to the bottom. And that makes collaboration a lot easier. It's certainly, even for yourself, coming back to a notebook and trying to recreate the state can be difficult if if you've gone out of order, or especially, you know, this isn't a pandas talk, but, you know, if, if people have put like, 50 different cells doing things to their pandas data frame and they've been executed in some order like being able to recreate that can be be difficult so so there are some best practices that i like to give folks so that they can uh, overcome a lot of those <laughs> issues you probably honed a lot of those by teaching people them too and yeah <laughs> I, I like to say that i'm covertly teaching software engineering best practices to these people who who don't want to be programmers right, right? Yeah. but for all intents and purposes they're sitting down at the computer and, and programming for a good chunk of the day yeah yeah dealing with performance issues can be a real pain for developers they not only affect the user experience but also lead to frustration and wasted time However, there's a powerful solution that can make this process much smoother and more efficient, Scout's APM tool. With Scout, you can pinpoint performance and stability issues in Python applications with ease. Scout's tracing logic detects the exact line of code, causing the performance abnormality, fixing the issue before customers ever notice. Start your 14-day free trial now at scoutapm.com. That's S-C-O-U-T-A-P-M dot com. So a couple things kind of related to the stuff you were saying a little bit earlier, how you had read some other books or had at least looked at them and thought to yourself, okay, what are key things that you felt needed to be included that maybe weren't included mm -hmm. that you put into this book? Yeah. I mean, I, I could rant. So it's funny. It's like once, once you start going down like the book writing phase, or I think a lot of people, if they like give a talk or probably as podcasters, you probably see a similar thing where once you start doing something, then you pay attention to it. It's, so like from type, typography, there's this notion of kerning okay, yeah. that a lot of people don't know about. That's like how far apart the letters are. Right. And 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 so I was reading a typography. When I wrote my first book, I read this typography book. And it was like, oh, I didn't even know these things existed. But then once you start noticing, now it's like, I can't unsee these things. Yeah, yeah. It's like being a, an editor. Um, uh, I've done some video editing. And okay, I yeah. have a le less of an appreciation of certain uh, <laughs> TV shows or films or commercials. And it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I see and, your work. And, <laughs> and for the other 99% of us, it's like, who, who knows, right? Yeah. So... I mean, I don't like to explicitly call out and disparage things. So maybe we'll talk in generalities of, of like. I was thinking like what would that you felt really needed to be in there? Like this is what I felt yeah. needed to be in this book. Yeah, I, I would classify a lot of of the machine learning content in sort of two schools of thought. Okay, a and one is more academic, right? Where it's like, this is you know all of the machine learning history up till you know five years ago or whatever because it took five years to compile this book and <laughs> yeah. it talks of, about not so much the history so to speak but it's a lot of formulas right and which might be nice but from my point of view not a lot of it is super applicable or or usable so to speak it's like oh this is kind of nice foundational knowledge if i wanted to go down to academia and i wanted to teach people all of these sort of esoteric facts about the math of these models, so to speak. Okay. So, so I wasn't necessarily interested in that because like when I go into my clients, I'm like, this is how you make a model and this is how you evaluate a model, right? It's pretty practical and hands-on. If you want to dive into the math, I can give you some pointers to do that. But the purpose of this is not a, a math class, so to speak. And then the other school of thought of, of a lot of material out there, at least for like machine learning, and I'm, I'm probably certainly somewhat guilty of this because I, I did this machine learning pocket reference that kind of does this, is, is sort of like, 
similar to the academic one, but it's like, okay, here's sort of the kitchen sink of like machine learning and how to use all the Python libraries for that. Right. Okay. But it's, it's, I, I would say not really going into a lot of depth, so to speak. So my goal with XG boost was I was finding, okay, there, this model is super popular with, for example, like cattle competitions, but my clients like to take advantage of it. And there are also ancillary libraries that are around the model that aren't really discussed, so to speak, in in one coherent place. So a lot of it was focus on XG Boost, but also look at the ecosystem around that. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, teaching education, a, a lot of it is curation, which is kind of what, like... You know, there's the question like, can like chat GPT replace education, so to speak? And maybe it can. I mean, I'm, I'm not sh- sold on like that with chat GPT four or whatever the latest version is, because a lot of it is I want to curate and, and provide sort of a path yeah, yeah. that I have experience with and, and can sort of dive into those details with. And I, I didn't see much material that sort of had an end-to-end path for XGBoost, so to speak. Like my last chapter is on MLflow, which is basically like deploying these models. And you don't really see a lot of content. It seems like a lot of the content sort of ends at like, okay, here's a model and here's how you make predictions and maybe a little bit on evaluation, but then that's it, right? Yeah. And, and so it sort of stops there. I had uh, Eric Mathis on. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He did um, uh-huh, the sure. Python crash course. And so we talked yeah. a lot about getting people to a point of doing things. And I feel like this book is trying to do something really similar to that. And along the way, signposting a lot of these things. It's like, this is important. You know, these are tools to kind of pay attention to. And and throughout it, you're doing a project. And what also is nice is, like you said, at the end of it, you're like, okay, it's also important that you understand there, what's maybe involved with deploying this thing and getting it up, standing up and so forth, and not just having it in, in your notebook. And so... I found that really interesting. And also the idea of like, hey, let's start with this set. And so it, it, there's a lot of theory in explaining, but it's not sidetracked down the rabbit hole and spending you know, tons of time there. You're actually working with the code and doing tons and tons of visualizations of things to kind of see as you go, which I really liked. And I, I think I mentioned this in your last book, also just the, the printing of it, this, that it's very, very colorful, which is really rare for a lot of the books that you see out on the shelf today. I, I'm sure that takes some effort for you to be able to get that done, but I appreciate it. And it's something that definitely shows as far as like trying to understand some of these concepts is just, okay, this is where it's moving into red. This is where it's moving into blue and, and so forth and kind of seeing uh, relationships because that's, really what a lot of these models are about yeah yeah thanks i yeah i i did spend a lot of time trying to work on the visualizations i'm a huge fan of that and i think they can tell a a good story but i think another thing that's useful about the book is is a lot of and 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 this i think is also goes back to the idea that i don't want to be a programmer A, a lot of people are what I would call stack overflow programmers where they can go and take (laughs) the code and and sort of copy and paste it. Right. And and I think you can do for, for a large extent, you can do a lot of that with the code from the XG boost book. And and it will sort of, you know, you will have to swap in your data and you might have to swap in some other things, but um, it's a boilerplate for an end to end project, which is, which is kind of nice. Yeah. And I mean, I think you, did this in your previous book, the effect was it effective pandas? Was that what it was called? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It had at the end of the chapters, you would have a set of questions, which I think is a really nice technique in a lot of these books. In this particular case, I, I remember at least a handful of the chapter, they would always kind of get into this idea of okay, all right, try this with your data here, you know, or whatever. What are the reasons that you feel like that needs to be included? Yeah, I think it goes back to to Eric Math's point and, and just like my understanding of, of teaching him pedagogy that there are various modes of learning, right? One is like listening to someone say something, one is seeing, but I, another one is doing. And my understanding from like the research I've done is that if you engage 
and this goes back to like the idea of rubber duck debugging, right? That's that notion, like I'm stuck on a problem. And if I go and talk to someone about it, yeah, it engages a different part of my brain. And I'm like, oh, I, I kind of, just by speaking about it to someone else or describing it, my brain makes these connections that it didn't make when I didn't vocalize that. I think it's the same thing with your fingers. When you actually go out and type the code in, you you learn it. And also when you see the errors pop up, like yeah. you you start to understand this a lot better than just having someone something that's like, here everything just works and you don't have to do anything. So what I really like is when subject matter experts just take this, they already understand their data. And then they're using this model to drive value from their data or even understand their data even more. And the only way that that's going to happen is by applying it. So yeah. huge, huge fan of moving beyond just reading and, and, and trying it out. One of the things that, if we kind of dive into the XG boost of it all, um, is where you want to apply this. You're starting with a model and you think that this this particular tool is going to help. Maybe we can kind of explain where it kind of comes into play and should you potentially try other techniques before you move into this technique? Okay. Is this is this the thing you should always go for first? I feel like it's not based upon uh-huh. reading through parts of the book. Yeah. Maybe it would help if I explained at a high level maybe how XG Boost works. Sure. And, and then maybe contrast that with maybe something like logistic regression, which is kind of your classical model that a lot of people would say kind of competes with, with XGBoost. So a common example is, is like people will, will do predictions of Titanic data. And so a lot of machine learning uh, teaching is, is done using the Titanic data, which is kind of weird. The idea there is is they have some of the passenger data from the Titanic and they have whether these folks lived or died on the Titanic. And, and the idea is make a model to predict whether someone will live or die on the Titanic, which is kind of silly in, a, in and of itself because there aren't Titanic boats leaving England every day, hitting <laughs> icebergs and sinking, right? right I right, mean, if yeah. that was the case, that would be really weird for like people to, to hop on this. But the sort of weird idea is that like, okay, if that was happening and these boats kept hitting icebergs and sinking, could you make some service where like before someone gets leaves on the Titanic, you could say, oh, come over here and give me some information and I will tell you whether you will live or die in the next three days or, or whatever, right? When, when this boat crashes into the iceberg. That, that's sort of the idea here. I, again, more realistic is maybe like we take some data about you and, and decide whether you have colon cancer or something like that, right? That, that you, you have cancer. So, but going back to the t- Titanic model, so you have things like gender, you have things like where they're in first class, you have things like how many children they had, or if they had siblings, how many siblings they had. And so you can use these feet, we call them features, but basically they're columns and each row is like an individual. And then you have a, a column that said whether they lived or died. So uh, with XG Boost, what we're doing at a high level is we are using what's called decision trees. And, and the idea with a decision tree is, let's say you have, you know, lived and died. Those are your two categories. You're going to go through every column and feature is the usual terminology that we use to, to call a column, right? So you might have sex, you might have what class they're in, you might have how much they paid for a ticket. Uh, so you'd go through each of those columns and you'd split it up. Like for sex, you might say, let's look at male and female because that's a, a, like a binary categorical. Or for, you know, there's first, second, and third class, so you might split it up into those three classes. Uh, for fair, some people like didn't pay anything. Some people paid like $500. So you'd have this threshold where you sort of go through all those different values. And I have an example in the book of doing this, but as you go through those values, you can see like if we split on a fare of $10, does that split up survive versus death better than we if we move the fare to like $50 or $100, right? Okay. And, and basically what the decision tree does is a greedy algorithm that's going to find the single 
feature with some value of that feature that splits the data the best for some metric that determines how the data is split. Okay. And then you recursively continue doing that. And, and so at the next level, you you look at the features again, you might consider looking at the same feature. That's one of the key points of that decision tree is because it can look at those features repeatedly, it can capture those nonlinearities, such as those U-shaped curves. So that's a, that's a basic decision tree. So all these trees are going to be based upon a core relationship and then go down branches where it's like, plus they were like this, plus they were from this country, plus they were, you know, and kind of building on. Exactly. Yeah, you could trace through this path in the decision tree and you could say, okay, this is an individual that is in first class. They paid this amount, they're a male, and they died, right? Okay. So that's a decision tree. And so XGBoost built upon this model. And, and the key thing about XGBoost is that... So with a single decision tree, it's kind of nice that like you can explain what's going on there. But decision trees have problems in that they tend to do this thing called overfitting, yeah. which is like you can imagine building a decision tree that just basically memorizes each individual. And at the bottom, you have all these nodes, so to speak, that are all pure, right? This is person A, this is person B, and this is person C. You can trace through their paths, which is kind of nice and it explains what happened there. But you know, in this hypothetical world where a new Titanic's leaving, there's probably going to be people who don't exactly line up with those other people. Right. So, so in that case, we call it overfitting. It's, it's basically memorizing the data. And it's not generalizing to new data. Right. You've perfectly described this set of data and it doesn't fit on anything else. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, if everything looks exactly like that, you don't need machine learning to do that, right? You just need some if statements to, to <laughs> see if right. they're exactly the same as something else. Okay. So so generally, we don't have data that max, matches exactly. And so typically with decision trees, is what we do is we simplify the model so it's not quite overfit. One way to do that is to prune the tree or, or to limit the depth of it. And, and that simplifies it a little bit. Um, but then at that point, when you look at the nodes, there's going to be some error in them. And so the, the sort of genius thing about XGBoost is that what it does is it's going to make the first tree and there'll be some error in it and it expects there to be error. But what it's going to do is the next tree is actually going to make a prediction based on the error and it's going to try and fix the error. Okay. So analogy I like to use is like golfing. Yeah. Like you can make a single decision tree and that's, like hitting the ball once, but XG Boost is like you hit the ball once and the, the ball will be some amount away from the hole that you're trying to get the ball into, but you can hit it again. And then there'll be some error, but you can hit it again and you can keep doing that. And these subsequent trees are basically correcting the error of the previous one. And in practice, that tends to give pretty robust models. So that's that's the the basic gist of XG Boost. Uh, because you can hit that ball multiple times, you're basically correcting the error. But because your trees aren't super deep, they're shallow. They tend to not be overfit, and and so they they tend to work well in the general case. The overfit would be doing it enough times to get the exact club and swing to to you know have this one perfect example that always hits but again you're not going to get that whereas it sounds like you're getting this very interesting flexibility of in between there by having the multiple shots if you will at, at trying to predict it yeah so off, like for these classification problems we don't have to get it exactly we just have to get it like closer to one side than the other okay and overfitting is like we're trying to get it exact right and, right. and getting that exact uh, it seems like it would work, but in practice, it doesn't. It doesn't work in the general <laughs> case because the data is going to be different. And yeah, the data is different. You know, the stuff you're training on is one thing, and then hopefully, the stuff you're you know actually testing on is going to be completely different. Or you know, yeah. And so, so that that's that that XG boost model, which works good. Contrast that with with like logistic regression, and logistic regression is is basically like doing a linear combination of the features multiplied by some weight to fit uh, this logistic curve, which is like a stretched out S, and where one end of that is is high and the other end of that is low, basically representing the two categories. And so the math works out such that 
you can say, okay, we're going to have all these weights and you're going to multiply each feature by a weight. And then you sum those up and you throw that into this formula and it will basically put it in this curve saying whether it's closer to the one or closer to the zero. And you label, you know, one is survive and zero is death. And then you can basically determine whether someone lives or dies based on doing that. So that's kind of logistic regression in a nutshell. Basically, it is looking at each feature, giving it a weight, and then throwing it into a formula to, to put it onto this curve. The nice thing about like logistic regression, so to speak, is that when you have weights for the feature, you can think about, you know, if that weight is the magnitude is larger, that would indicate that the feature has more impact on determining whether someone lived or died, so to speak. And so we call this a white box model or an explainable model. And oftentimes yeah, yeah. people at banks will want that, right? If you go in to get a loan and someone says, we're not going to give you a loan, but if you raise your credit score to 700, we will give you a loan because our model tells us that that will push you over the threshold. Yeah, yeah. Right? Whereas an XG boost model would be, you might have 500 trees in an XG boost model. And they might say, we're not giving you a loan. And you ask, why not? And they're like, well, um, we have these decision trees. We could go through all 500 of them, right? But that, <laughs> yeah, right. that really wouldn't be... Let's we'll see where we fit in here. <laughs> yeah, that, that might take a long time. And, and so there, there's a trade-off though, right? The XG boost model might be more accurate, but it might have a business expense such that like customers don't like it because you can't explain why you didn't give them a loan. So you, you have a lot of customer churn because of that. Right. So, so these are trade-offs, but like I said, one of the cool things you can do with XG boost is you can make these models. You can look at what features are important to the models and you could go back and use that to augment your simpler model, right. With better data such that you can make a explainable model if you wanted to yeah. by, by doing the XG boost combination with them. And the nice thing about the Python library, the Python ecosystem, is like XG boost is provided by the scikit-learn library. And there's a common API interface for all of the classifiers in the scikit-learn library, such that if you can make a model for logistic regression, all you have to do is change the class and you can make a model for XG boost. Yeah. So, so that makes it really nice to just try out different models. And some models might have characteristics that perform better for your business case than other models. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. And it's on a topic that's tangential to what we discussed this week. If you're interested in enhancing your data science skills to make predictions from your data sets, this course can get you rolling. It's titled, starting with linear regression in Python. It's based on a real Python article by Mirko Stojilkovic, and in the course, instructor Cesar Aguilar takes you through what linear regression is and what it's used for, how to implement linear regression in Python step-by-step, step. not only how to set up simple linear regression, but also multiple linear and polynomial regression. You'll learn how to use methods from the scikit-learn library to assist you in creation of the regression. I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn how to find the relationships among variables and use that knowledge to forecast and make predictions. Like most of the video courses on Real Python, the course is broken into easily consumable sections. And where needed, you get code examples for the techniques shown, in this case, a Jupyter notebook for you to follow along with. All our courses have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the search tool on realpython.com. One of the things that you were talking about in the book in kind of being able to dig into the black box of this thing and, and explain it was this thing, I'm guessing it's pronounced SHAP. I don't know if it's SHAP or SHAPE. Uh, S-H-A-P, okay. Uh, SHAP, um, yeah. Maybe you could talk about that mm -hmm. a little bit and, and why you decided to include that in is one of the sure. is one of those things where you're like, hey, I wanted to include this in the book because it it's a tool that will help with this process. Yeah, yeah. So SHAP. Is, so again, one of the one of the great things about XG Boost is it tends to give robust models kind of out of the box. It, so in my experience, it does overfit slightly over out of the box. So with a little bit of tuning, the hyperparameters basically the depth of the tree and there are other hyperparameters to control how these trees are made. You can generally get better performance by tuning it, but it tends to do relatively well at the box. Again, one of those big downsides with the XGBoost model is this 
notion of black box. It's not really explainable. I would like, I would say it's more of a gray box. Again, if you want to dive through all 500 trees, you could work out the math and, and do that. But in practice, no one wants to do that because it's so tedious. So what we do is we make these models that are what we would call a surrogate model to explain it. And, and a popular one these days is the SHAP model. And basically what this is doing is it's saying we're going to use some game theory to look at the features and say how the features impact the final prediction. And basically what you get is you get these plots that basically show a feature. And as you change the value of the feature, how does that impact in like the Titanic case towards survival or death. Okay. So you might you might actually see something in, in Titanic where you might have some U-shaped relationship where it's like, okay, we're going to let the babies live and we're going to let the older folks live, but the people in the middle we're, we're not going to let live, right? Or, or something like that. I mean, I watched... So apparently my kids hadn't seen the Titanic movie, so we watched it the other night. And apparently it wasn't that case at all. It was just old rich men like pushing everyone off the boats and getting in them. <laughs> yeah. It did kind of use to use what you're saying there. Does that help the, uh, I don't know, loan officer then have a, a handful of scenarios that, that could help with explaining it? Yeah. So, so the shaft light, so, so possibly, right. I, again, it, it might depend on the business, but one of the nice things about the shaft library is that it can explain a single feature. Okay. So you, you can get like the scatter plot of a single feature and how that feature impacts the final prediction. You can also get what we call local prediction. So it can say, okay, here's some person who is on the Titanic. I want you to predict or, or I want you to explain why they survived, okay. right? And it will say, well, their age and their class pushed them more towards survival, but maybe uh, where they embarked from pushed them more towards death, but these other ones overcame it. So it actually gives you what we call like a waterfall plot of, of some values pushing it more towards one way and some values pushing it toward the other one. And the ones that push it more are, are basically are the, are the ones that are causing it to uh, have that prediction. So it does... It helps you understand features. It helps you understand a local prediction. And it also helps you understand what we call a global prediction. So once you have like these features, you understand like how a feature impacts final prediction and you see like how much they impact that, you can rank order those, right? So there might be certain features that have more of an impact than other features. So then you can rank order those and say, okay, these are the features that are more important. But also when you drill into the individual features, the individual feature can help you understand some of those nonlinearities, what you will actually see in these scatter plots. <laughs> that bathtub thing or Cur weird curves. Bathtub or, yeah. curves, or you'll see curves that aren't just straight lines, right? And and the, the cool thing about that uh, to me as a data person is, is like, this is telling you what is in the data, right? It's telling you these relationships that then you can go back and you can say, like, why is that? Or maybe we can dig into the data and try and understand, like, these occurrences or, or, or things that pop out when we're making the model, which I, I find just fascinating that you'll often see, like, nonlinear relationships that, like, okay, yeah, that makes sense now that we, we saw that. But just by looking at a table of data, it would be really hard to come to that conclusion, at least for me. Is that something where in this... I feel like it's all very much an iterative process, the, you know, d building a model and, and going through it. And this is where you would come back to potentially some of the hyperparameters. Are there ones that, that you'd want to mention as we're kind of going through it as far as like XG Boost, like stuff that is kind of unique to its hyperparameters? Yeah, I, I mean, there is an iterative process. Um, so in the book, I, I have some code that I think is, is relatively nice. So th there's probably two dozen hyperparameters for XGBoost, right? And so if you think about these hyperparameters and all of the different values, there's a combinatorial explosion. And for you to like test all these values and, and like do all the combinations, you'd be here for a long time doing that. <laughs> yeah. So in the book, I have some nice code that does stepwise hyperparameter tuning. So it's basically saying, okay, let's look at hyperparameters that impact the tree. Let's look at hyperparameters that impact how that it generalizes. Let's and and so it kind of goes through phases and doesn't do all the combinations, but does a small subset at once. And I find that that 
is for me kind of a nice trade-off and that it doesn't take forever to run, but um, it tends to give you better performance relatively quickly than looking at all combinations. I also use a library called Hyperopt, which instead of, you could imagine if you've got a hyperparameter that, that ranges like a floating point number, you have infinite number of choices to choose in there, right? So again, that's something that could take a long time. So this Hyperopt library uses Bayesian st- statistics to basically say, okay, when we set this parameter to this value, it did well. So we're going to exploit that and we're going to sort of search closer to that area. Mm. But every once in a while, we'll do an exploration step where we're sort of jump out of that and just make sure that we're not on a local minimum. Huh. Okay. The book has some code that kind of gives you that, which is kind of nice. It's one of those sort of copy and paste things that you can take and run. But at a at a high level, hyperparameters that you want to tweak generally is the depth of, of your tree, right? I think the default depth is six. Is that the right number? It depends. Probably not. But generally, the, the suggestion is you want to keep your trees shallower because we don't want them to be overfitting. We want them to actually be kind of what machine learning people call weak learners. We want them to not have a lot of strength because we're going to correct that later on. And then another one that's common to adjust is how many trees there are, Okay. right? So how many times you're hitting the ball. And then there's another one, which is the learning rate. You can think of that as, as how hard you're hitting it. So you, you can think of a situation where you might be overhitting the hole and then you hit again and you overhit it this way and you kind of go back and forth and finally you get into that. Whereas if you didn't hit it quite as hard, but you just kept hitting it, you you might get to that hole quicker than if you're overhitting it. So that the number of trees and how hard you hit it actually have a relationship with one with each other. Okay. So as you lower how hard you hit it, you probably want to give it a, a few more trees to allow it to converge. But Again, you're going to be looking at metrics as we're going along, right? So as you change hyperparameters, there are tools that allow you to evaluate your model and make sure that it's not overfitting, that it's that it's performing as well as it can, given the hyperparameters that it, it has to work with. Yeah. One of the things that you that we've mentioned a couple times now is this idea that at the end of the book, you get into deploying. What, what are the tools that you're showing off there? Yeah. So, so one of the nice tools that we have is ML Flow, which could probably be its own book in and of itself. <laughs> sure. But the, but the nice thing about that is that with with that library, we can do things like we can track how our hyperparameters are performing, and so if we're doing a lot of experimentation, we can use ML Flow to track that. But you can also basically say, okay, I'm going to freeze this model at this point in time. And then it has really easy code to basically say, okay, once we have that model, we want to deploy it to Docker. And so you can basically say like, okay, this is the model ID, throw that into Docker, and it will build a Docker container with a REST API that deploys your model in it. So with, again, the nice thing about these models is it's not a lot of code to, to do a lot of this stuff, right? But again, like I didn't find any book that had an end to end, like we're going to start from the data and go to like, here's actually uh, deploying this model, right? So can you can you find a lot of this information? Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it, it's out there on the internet, but to get it curated, it's, it's not curated in, in, in very many spots. Yeah, yeah. Were there any other things that you were super excited about that, you wanted, you were like, oh, I found this. I want to make sure I include this in this book. Yeah. So like you said, there's a lot of visualizations in the book trying to understand hyperparameters, how they're impacting the model. One of the libraries that I do find interesting, again, this is one of those ones that you don't see mentioned a lot, is this XGB FIR model, okay. which uh, it is XGB stands for the XG boost feature interactions, and I don't, I don't remember what the R is, but basically, it's th- this is an interesting library. It seems like this is someone who who was doing research on this, and um, not necessarily again one of those people who who wasn't necessarily a Python programmer, so to speak, but took okay. like their Java best practices. So the, the interface is a little weird in that like you interact with this by running some Python code and the output isn't like a pandas data frame. It's actually 
Excel spreadsheet. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so you run the code, it spits out a spreadsheet, and then you can use pandas to suck in the spreadsheet. But what, what it does is it tells you these feature interactions. So, so this is something that a decision tree can capture, which is, you know, if age is going up, does that have an impact on maybe first class or second class for, for Titanic, so to speak, is, is there a relationship? You know, if you are young and in first class, are you more likely to survive than maybe if you're young and in third class? So that is something that you wouldn't be able to represent in a logistic regression model just with the single columns. But because of how a tree can look at a, a column, then look at another column, basically, if you inspect the trees and you see columns coming after other columns and that happens a lot that's probably an indication that there's some relationship going on between those two features yeah right and so that's what this uh, feature interactions library does is basically analyzes the artifacts of your model and then goes through and tells you okay these are the two these are the two pairs of columns that have the most feature interactions right or here's the triplets of columns yeah that have the most feature interactions which again to me as as a data person is fascinating in that basically we're feeding the data into these models and they're coming back and giving us insights into yeah there is a relationship here between age and class on the boat so to speak and whether you survive or not that's cool yeah it sounds like all these tools are kind of helping you just understand what's happening with it and with that that information you're making much better decisions <laughs> with what you're going to do with it yeah and this is this is key for for data scientists because data scientists need to be able to communicate yeah. and, and basically sell <laughs> their solution yeah, yeah, yeah oftentimes there isn't one right solution like, like i said oftentimes the answer is it depends it depends and so being able to back up why you came up with the solution you did yeah yeah using tools like shap using these feature interactions using some of the other visualizations that we come we show in the book can be super useful for selling the solution that you came up with yeah i think that's pretty uh, you know i've been in some meetings before where somebody's presenting a model and presenting some raw data and i feel like those little pieces of extra information would have been enough to like fend off a lot of questions and 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 at least give people that it's is not purely like you said it's more of a gray box yeah you you can imagine again it's not hard to make a model it's like three lines of code in python right so you can imagine right. someone in a meeting and they're like here's our model and they're like well why does it do this? And they're like, we don't know, but the, you know, we made it and this is, we evaluated, this is the score that we got, so we should deploy it, right? Science! Um, <laughs> yeah, we did it. Yeah. <laughs> Versus someone else who, who said, okay, here's our model, here's sort of the pros and cons, right? It works really well with this uh, subsection here and we can show you these relationships that we gleaned out of it. Or, you know, we, could, we can tell by looking at the data that if we added these other features, it would do even better but this is what we have today. Yeah. So a, again, just just being a, making a model uh, on its own is not particularly interesting. There's the whole story and the data that goes uh, with it that that is a super important skill to have. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So maybe we should uh, mention, you know, how can people get a copy of the book if, if they're interested? Yeah, so digital version I sell at uh, my, my website, metasnake.com. You go to store.metasnake.com. It's available there. I'll put a discount code in for listeners, and uh, I'll let Chris link to that. Yep, I'll put in the show notes, yeah. Yeah. Physical book, I, I don't want to deal with distribution of physical books, so I, I uh, abstract that out, and Amazon does that for me. Okay. In in most places where Amazon is, I do have distributor in, in India as well, so for folks in India... I've worked with a publisher there to to get a a. Turns out that printing a color book and as Chris mentioned, like the color, the printing quality of the color book is. is I'm obviously biased, but I, it's very high quality. Yeah, and, and so it turns out that that's pretty pricey to do. And, and, and so yeah, for for the Indian market, we there's a grayscale version that's priced more in line with with what they're used to. Yeah. 
So uh, I have these weekly questions I like to ask everybody. Uh, yeah. What's something that you're excited about that's happening in the world of Python? Yeah. So that I don't know if you've heard of the Mojo language. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd still want to try to get somebody involved with the project on the show, but that we talked about it. Yeah. 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 So I, I think there, there's the perennial, like everyone wants to scratch their itch about what their issues are with Python. And, and certainly I have my opinions about, you know, good and bad things of Python. But uh, I, I think that's interesting. It's going to be interesting to see, you know, how far the project gets. Uh, the The nice thing about it is it d- does have like a company behind it. Yeah. A lot of a lot of these efforts in the past have been more one person doing it. And I think a, a lot of these things are hard problems, yeah. right? And, and I love open source. I've used open source for a long time. I ran Gentoo Linux on my laptop for 15 years. So I'm not, I'm not at all like uh, unfamiliar with open source, but, but oftentimes, you know, having someone who has to ship a product, right. And, and has, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, pressure rather than a scratch your itch can do different things or accomplish different things. So I, I think this will be interesting from that point of view. Yeah. Hopefully they can have a tool that makes makes some people happy i don't i i think it, it'd be impossible to make <laughs> everyone happy yeah, yeah, yeah. which is probably why why we haven't seen a ton of you know we, we see like 10 percent here sort of speed ups but you know python is still this might be news to some people but python is still a slow language right yeah, yeah. and that's why like libraries like pandas and xg boost are actually not written in python but we have a Python interface to these libraries that uh, run relatively fast. So I, I'm interested in, in playing with that and, and seeing where that goes. Have you joined the playground for it? I haven't yet. Okay. Yeah. I've been, I've been exploring, but I, I, I did a deep dive about it when there was an announcement and I, I okay. looked at, you know, what is, Chris Latner been doing and it's kind of wild watching this team of people kind of bounce around from different companies and have the funding from the companies to kind of explore this area and then land at this new organization and he's kind of kept the team together it's a lot of the same people which is really interesting and so I feel like there's a momentum there and then the other interesting thing was just like I think they had this need to make an announcement in order to kind of keep funding going and uh, so it'll be interesting. I, I, I don't know. I think it'll be sooner than later that we'll see it and, and get to play with it. Yeah. But yeah, it's definitely in that ML space and, and this thing, these areas that we're able to deal with huge amounts of data need some new different tools than we currently have. Yeah. For, from, my, from my point of view, like, like from the Panda side, right? Pandas is relatively fast, and Pandas 2 certainly helps with that. But oftentimes, we, we do cross that fast barrier, and we go back to the Python side, right? Yeah. And and so, like, your solutions now are use NumPy, use Cython, use Numba, which have their pros and cons. So if if Mojo could could help with some of those cons, I think that, like, from, from the machine learning data side, that could be certainly... Uh, interesting yeah be pretty huge what's something that you want to learn next um so so i am thinking about starting a podcast oh so all right i i'm open to ask you can ask me questions anytime okay so. <laughs> maybe yeah maybe we should take that offline yeah that's fine <laughs> cool yeah nice so I, I don't have i don't have any other uh, any other details on that other than that so we'll leave that okay we'll leave that there but, that sounds uh, good yeah all right how can people follow what you do online? Yeah. So I have a, a mailing list at metasnake.com. That's that's my company, Metasnake, uh, like like Meta the company, but with a snake after it. Yeah. So I, I had that name before me- Facebook became Metasnake. So <laughs> yeah. my kids say I should change my, my company's name to Facebook Snake, but I don't <laughs> think that, that has, nah. has a good name. I, I'm at Metasnake and then I'm on... I, Twitter or X or whatever it's called these days. Yeah, maybe it will be around still when when the podcast release. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Threads as well. We'll see if I'm on other <laughs> social media as well. Yeah, it's such a weird turbulent time. <laughs> yeah, as far as all that. Yeah. Well, I really want to thank you for coming on the show again. It's been fun talking to you. Yeah. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me back. 
And don't forget, take the stress out of development and start your journey towards a smoother, more efficient app experience. Try Scout now and witness the difference it makes in your development at scoutapm.com. I want to thank Matt Harrison for coming back on the show this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.